Uh, well, welcome everyone. We're very glad that you're here. Please feel free to put your questions below, any type of comments you have throughout the, com throughout the presentation. I'll be sure to be sharing those um, with Jared and Daniel as we go. So just to give you a little bit of background of what we're gonna be covering today, Jared and Daniel, um, can you hear me? Okay, so I'm just muting myself because it's causing some issues here. Um, so introducing Jared, um, so he, it's craving for innovation and creativity. He is the VP for this new venture that they're gonna go into detail as we go through the presentation. Um, he has started and launched a variety of different businesses and NGOs in the areas of senior living communities, juice bars, consumer products, really, really good stuff. Um, his wife and him live in a small farm outside Atlanta, Georgia with alpacas, chickens, and ducks. And Daniel Bruno, who is also joining us, it's very passionate about creating bespoke user experiences for businesses and missions that shift the existing processes and organizational culture that we live in. Um, he is the CEO of this venture and they're gonna walk to you guys in more detail as to what they are. So I'm just gonna leave the time for them to take it from here. And I'll be the one who moderates some of the questions that come through or any comments that you guys have. So Daniel and Jared, please feel free to take it from here. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate that. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna share a screen. Daniel and I are gonna go back and forth. And then at the end of it, we'll have time for some questions. So as long as you're keeping track of those questions, Christina, we'll be all set. Um, so yeah, great. Well, hey, uh, if we can, we'd love to pray as we start, and then we will jump right in. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we're grateful for everybody who's tuned in today. You know, the busy lives that everybody is winning and running right now. And uh, we just pray that you'll guide our steps, help this to be a blessing to everybody who's listening, and to us, to Daniel and I. We thank you for the opportunity. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, yeah, let's jump in. So, Daniel and I today, we're going to talk to you about the power of authentic stories. And uh, he and I are pretty passionate about this as it relates with a brand and having your own business. So, we actually think this is at the core of it all. So, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel and Daniel, kick us off. Yeah. So I just want to kind of um, welcome everybody. Good to see everybody. Uh, brilliant to be here with you. Um, just to kind of kick things off, you know, stories and, and genuine authentic stories really, as Jared mentioned, are at the core of everything here. You know, a story and a narrative, a well put together narrative for your business. It's, uh, it's fundamentally about you. Um, it's fundamentally about your, your business, your entity. And it's going to keep consumers listening, but it's also a differentiator as well. The very narrative of your startup or company, um, it can actually connect you to investors, it can connect you to employees, it can connect you to the people that you're actually trying to reach. So it's critically important. And this, this morning or this afternoon, should I say, our goal for us today is really, as we go through this, is to kind of get through some, an evidence-based approach of storytelling. So how do stories really affect us? And then kind of how do we actually create the stories that can actually power your brand? That's really what we want to get to today, get to those practical steps. So with that said, um, John, maybe you can read this out for us and kind of take it from here. Yeah, this is how passionate we are. So basically, we have this belief that stories are everything. And you can see this slide. The stories we tell literally make the world. If you want to change the world, you need to change your story. And we're completely sold on this idea. Um, and, and basically, one of the inspirations for Daniel and I, there is this book called The Power of Moments. And it really talks about at the end of your life, you will remember the high points. You will remember these remarkable moments that just stood out from the rest. Those may be that one sunset, they may be that one smell and that one place, but there's something, that one laugh, that one experience that you're gonna remember. It's interesting, they interview people and they, they literally have a handful of memories that are just indelible. So this morning or this afternoon now, we wanna really talk you through why stories drive experience and why experience drives story and, and why they're so intricately linked and why they make such a difference with the world of business. 
And the first one I want to do is I want to jump you into the story of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. So this is in 1 Kings chapter 10. And rather than me butcher it, I'm just going to read you a high point. It's in verse 4. Uh, the Queen of Sheba comes to visit Solomon. She comes to test him. A lot of people believe she basically give him lots of riddles. Are you as smart as they say? And in verse 4 of 1 Kings chapter 10, it says, When the Queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, I'm going to skip all the inner part here. At the end of it, it says she was breathless. That she was so impressed by what she experienced that it took her breath away. And now I'll read to you the middle part. It says, these were the things where how she saw the wisdom of Solomon. She saw the house he built, so she was impressed by his architectural skills, but probably the detail and how it came together. The food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants and their clothing. Every single detail was meticulously thought through so that the entire experience of somebody that came to visit Solomon, they, he knew because he was the originator of these experiences, how every single element played into the next. So here, I mean, just the way people dressed, the way they interacted with each other, the way they sat down, the way the food was arranged on his table, likely what kind of food in the presentation. So as you're thinking of your business, your venture, how do you back up and start to think through every single micro experience that's going on when people experience your your venture so this story to me is one of the best in talking about experience and uh, we'll keep going forward that's one definitely to pay attention to and, and i like that because um that's a good lead point Chad. because what that helps us understand that if, if we can keep this on the shelf in our brain like a, a metaphorical shelf think about this idea of experience because we're going to come back to that stories kind of direct experience experience drive back to the stories and and just to kind of give us a little bit of an evidence-based approach to how we are um, designed, God created us to actually absorb, to hear, to react to stories. And um, I want to kind of just tell you, give you a couple of interesting quotes here and a couple of interesting little s s snippets and studies that really kind of speak to this. Here's a good quote. It's in the Journal of Neuroscience. It's not that old, October 2019. It says, storytelling engages not just people's intellect, but also their feelings. So it's an intellect and feeling thing. A bold recitation of facts invariably lacks the impact and the enduring power of a coherent narrative that awakens one's emotions. So this story aspect is both intellect, it's both emotions, everything that scripture provides, if you think about it in that respect. And what's interesting with this is that what brain science has been understanding, even just in the past um, um, year or so, and a little bit before that, there's been a lot of research that is trying to understand, uh, understand that are there actually universal patterns to stories? Sure, I can tell you a story, but does that, you know, does that create the same effect in other people? Well, sure, there's going to be some variance and differences, but stories as an essence of what stories are, what actually brain science has been revealing um, is that there's actually universal patterns and brain patterns in actual stories that are told. For example, there's this one study, it's about three years old, so it's not, not too old, fairly new, um, and it basically did this. It took 20 million stories, they used a very and sophisticated software and algorithm that passed through 20 million stories sourced from all over all over, the, all over the internet different aspects they whittled that down to 40 stories and then that was whittled down to a 150 word paragraph that was then translated directly into farsi to mandarin chinese into english so three very distinct cultures three very distinct aspects and the reason why it's a, it was whittled down to that much paragraph is that what they were trying to do is to remove any biases, right? In an experimentation of neuroscience, you always want to remove those biases so that this essence, people can understand what's being said. And what they found is that when they actually read these out and then and actually had these people, they heard it out aloud or they read it themselves, the brain, the brain patterns, they actually did this in fMRI, so they took brain scans. The brain scans were identical, not identical, but they were very similar across all all, all people who were doing this. So whether um, it's a language of Farsi, whether it's Chinese or English, brain patterns were universal. The stories had a universal effect on the brain. And that's, and that's a brilliant thing to think about if you think about it, right? If, if, you know, the power of stories is not just something like, oh, I heard a good story and it made something to me. It actually affects us, it actually changes, it actually, it actually creates various patterns in the brain that actually hits our cognitive system, our emotional system. And here's another quote from that same journal in that same month, it says, 
it kind of went on and developed this thought further. It said accuracy is essential in even the best narrative, which draws its power from the truths that underline the story. So two things here, because I want you to keep this in mind as we kind of go through our little talks this morning and our inter interaction we're going to have together. The word accuracy there is essential, but also the accuracy itself actually draws its power from the truths that underline the story. Think about this in scripture, for example. You know, think of, a, you know, the arresting truth is one of the core reasons for why Jesus, you know, spoke in parables. And, and, his, and you know, the, the parables themselves, they're not just stories. They, they had truths that underline them. You think of this or the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, you have this interchange between the, the, the expert lawyer, between Jesus that occurs in Luke chapter 10. You can read the story there in verse 30 onwards. And you can, and essentially what, what happens in this, in, this, in this story here, this interchange happens. And at the interchange, basically, Jesus goes on to tell the, 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 uh, the expert, the lawyer, after saying, you know, what, what, what's, what's, what are the best parts of the law? And Jesus goes in and explains. And then he says, and then the lawyer opens up, who is my neighbor? He asks that question, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus delves into the, the actual parable itself. And he talks about the, the Levite, the priests, those that le left the person who had fallen by the wayside aside. But the Samaritan came and picked up that person, anointed him with oil put him on his donkey, went to the inn, gave money to the innkeeper. He treated the, this person in, in a way that kindness and honesty that, um, that the expert lawyer who was interacting with Jesus at the time didn't understand. And so when Jesus asked the lawyer the question at the end of the parable, and says, which of these three, whether it was a Samaritan, the priest, the Levite, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man um, who fell in the hands of the robbers? And the expert in law replied, the one who had mercy on him, the one who had mercy on him. And the reason I'm telling you this is that the, here we have both accuracy and truths that underlie the actual parable and those truths actually drive the reaction, the cause, the, the behavior change that occurs here in the Esper Law. The, the story meant something. It was powerful. And in fact, Ellen White um, talks about parables and, 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 and the reasons for them in, in, in many fashions. And Christ's Object Lessons, page 22, is a pretty neat one. Just listen to this. It says in parables, he rebuked the hypocrisy and wicked works of those who occupied high positions. And in figurative language, talking about the parables here, clothed truth of so cutting a character that had it been spoken in direct denunciation, they would not have listened to his words and would speedily have put an end to his ministry. So this was figurative language, clothed truth, so cutting of character. That's the power of parable. And the reaction when they heard when, when the expert lawyer heard this, he realized what he needed to do, right? And so we can see this play out. We see this, these parables. We see these truths that Jesus has. We see these play out in the stories that we hear today. And Jan, maybe this is a good place for you to kind of tell a little bit about Ben's story and the research study I'm going to explain that occurred with Ben's story. Absolutely. So I think it's good on that last note. The reason Jesus was so passionate about storytelling was so that he could drive behavior transformation so that people would live differently this is why you know madison avenue seeks to hijack our brains with telling us parts of a story that we find absolutely enamored uh, enamoring to us and therefore we usually want to buy the product so that we can somehow vicariously live in that story that we saw on a screen so here's an example of the power of a story uh, so you kind of got to imagine this one of this boy named Ben and you imagine this commercial, it's basically goes like this and you hear on the screen, Ben's dying. That's what Ben's father says to the camera as we see Ben playing in the background. So Ben is two years old. He doesn't know that a brain tumor will take his life in a matter of months. And Ben's father tells us how difficult it is to be joyful around Ben because the father knows what is coming. But in the end, he resolves to find the strength to be genuinely happy for Ben's sake, right up to Ben's last breath. So personal stories like this can be uh, extremely impactful, especially if you're a parent. And as a new dad, Daniel being a new dad, like these type of stories are just heart wrenching. But here's what happened. Daniel, tell us what happened as people heard this story of Ben and his father. Yeah, and this is, this is a, another great study, um, and my background is in cognitive neuroscience, so this is why I'm excited about these studies. You know, um, what happened, they actually, 
had their story read out and they had participants in the experiment. And as they listened to that story, a couple of interesting things happened in the brain that they were measured, right? That their attention increased and there was engagement, just as you may have heard the story. And um, this is a, a story that has relevance. It has truth to it and their intention increased. And also then the, the, there was a release of oxytocin and oxytocin, as many of you may know, is that hormone chemical in the brain that relates to all sorts of things of um, people being more trustworthy or being generous, being charitable, being compassionate. All those kind of elements are, are, are related to the release of oxytocin and the synthesis of that in the brain when we are in that place of we hear something good and we want to do something good because of that. And so these two things happen. So an increase in attention, an increase of oxytocin. And what's interesting here, and for those of you who may or may not know, whenever you do a research study, if you're doing a behavioral study specifically, you're all often given an incentive to come and do the study. We're going to take an hour of your time. We'll give you some money for that study. At the end of that study, you can, you know, that's, that's your thank you for doing the study. But what's interesting is that nearly all the participants in this study, what they did, they donated a portion of their earnings in the experiment. It actually wasn't part of the, the study requirements. They didn't, they didn't have to do that. They wanted to, they were saying, hey, if Ben is sick, I want to give a portion of my earnings or what I'm getting for Ben without being asked to do that at all. And what's interesting is that they, they did, what they found is that those who donated after watching Ben's story, they actually had more empathetic concern for other people. They had more empathy for others. And so it's a, it's a powerful reminder. I mean, I mean, yeah, this is like the Good Samaritan story being played out in reality in terms of that behavior change and what brain science is trying to uncover. God, obviously, who designed this, has known from the very beginning. So um, we just want, kind of wanted to share that with you. Here's the evidence base of the power of what stories are. And we're really just drawing people into a story with all these examples. Um, so, Daniel, this next slide, I'm going to read it uh, about the people want to be part of something bigger. Oh, this yeah, is a good quote, yeah. People want to be part of something bigger than themselves, a nameless, faceless corporation with no real purpose, no story is not an inspiring place to be. So, you know, we all want to be a part of, that's why we buy stuff from certain brands. It's just this idea for many of us that we just want to be a part of something that matters. And for your startup or your business, there's got to be a story. And I just think of, you know, in a, in a sermon you hear or a whatever you're watching or reading, if it's just facts, you're not going to remember it. We sell the best cars. They make the best speed. They're amazing gas mileage. It's like boring. I don't have time for this. But you'll notice Elon Musk every other week, he's just making up a new product so that people buy into the narrative of this guy is just an inventor. I want to be an inventor. I want to be a part of this movement of Tesla. That's why the stock is overvalued at a level that's never been seen in history. Um, people are obsessed with this guy's story and what's he gonna think of next? So you've gotta have something that you have as a story in your brand so that when your brand is not being shown in front of someone, no images, no visuals, no logos, that people can recall, oh yeah, I know what they do. They do this and I think here's why they do it and I think I actually know who their target audience is. And as, as soon as you have those ingredients, uh, you've got something. So uh, we just want to walk you through what are some of those ingredients. So as you're trying to figure out what's your story for your company or honing in on it, who are you? Where did you come from? Why are you doing this? And this is huge as you're looking to talk with people who may be stakeholders or investors with you. And so, um, <clears throat> Daniel, why don't you share some of the backstory on Experience Foundry that got us to, uh, you know, you and I began to collaborate as of a few years ago. Yeah, it's a perfect, there's a perfect opportunity to talk about that just a little bit. And um, those three components, so if you take those three components of um, who we are and where do we come from and kind of why we're doing this, kind of the why and who and, and, uh, and the kind of components of of the in the kind of the ethos of why we exist and um, the experience foundry is a is a really a passion venture and that has been very successful in the past three years since its launch and been very blessed in in the work that's been involved in that and i think if we were to take the you know as jared mentioned there's these three components we're looking at who are we who are you right these things that you should be asking as you're building your story where did you come from why are you doing it so if i were to say you know who are we if we look at our origin story and um, for example it's we're an experience design an innovation consultancy, if I put it in those broad times, with, with a think tank arm, right? That's that's the who we are. And but, but then 
if I just say that to you, that doesn't mean much without anything else. So if we, if we start to uncover, like, where do we come from and why are we doing this? Well, maybe Jared, I'll throw it back to you. Listen to us as we begin to tell a story amongst ourselves about how this came to be. And it's going to be more verbose than what it would be on a piece of paper, but it, but it, it gives you an idea of, the, of how this works. Yeah, so I remember Daniel, the first time uh, he started to tell me about this idea of micro interactions and his PhD being in human computer interaction, uh, I was pretty enamored by this idea of what are these interactions we have with the brand, which is really with the story that completely draws us in. And as the more we talked about this idea of micro interactions, I was completely obsessed with the idea and Daniel and I, we just started to think of, uh, really, there was nothing between us yet, but it was, we started to dissect other, other ventures, other companies, other organizations. And it's like, what do you remember about them? When you go eat there, when you go to that resort, when you go fly that airline, what is it you remember? Like, what's these little details that make it all the worth it? And we really started to think of, our passion is creating these little experiences that collectively make up uh, an entire experience that's not just one memorable moment, but a lot of. And that, that led us to start to be able to help some others think through their process on how are people interacting with your brand and your story and, and what are all the touch points and are they remarkable? So Daniel, yeah, take it from there. Yeah, no, it's key. And I think one key thing to know as well is that, you know, and this is a key thing for those of you who are starting startups. You know, Jared and I are really good friends um, in addition to that. But friendship aside, right, it's not just because we're passionate about something, we're friends, we create something. We put a structure in place that really speaks to the passion of our experiences, of our background. Jared, as a, as a phenomenal ideator, right, as a, who started many ventures. On my end here, I've, I've, my background's in the world of experience design, of innovation, of, of creating those labs in, in different corporate entities, for example. And I, and my last place of that, we, we started something out of Delta Airlines, like the last place I came from where I built a experience design organization. And, and the reason for that is that all those components, the ingredients in essentially, and we're going to talk about ingredients a little bit later on, they existed, they were there. And so we put those together. And so really the, the engine that drives these experiences, and you may say, well, you know, we're a consultancy firm that creates experiences. There are many that do that. We part and we complement, you know, there's a with other consulting firms, you know, I think Titan Symbols is a great example of a, of a premier Adventist based design firm that we just enjoy partnering with and working with. But our focus and engine is on the behavior analytics, right? So it's taking the cognitive neuroscience, it's taking the blend of pure data science and platform analytics, it's taking behavioral measures. And when you put those together, you get this behavioral analytics model, this engine that actually drives and actually has the ability to drive them actual true innovation and true experiences that are based on true user needs, objective user needs, as opposed to simply ones that simply say, I think they want this and I'm going to test it in a little while. So it's really this behaviorally driven approach that really distinguishes what we do and why we're passionate about it. And the model that we've built and developed actually has been translated in different ways and used it against around different entities. And a good example of that, if I can kind of um, show that is actually going to come up. But before we actually get to that, I want Jared to talk about this because while that's a good story about who we are and the, and the work we do, there's more to that, right? There's more to our story. And Jared, maybe you can touch on this and I'll fit in as well. Yeah. So yeah, kind of playing off that story you told earlier, Daniel, on the great, uh, the Good Samaritan. Um, we started to look at the golden rule and really flesh through the idea of, you know, Jesus says, whatever it is you'd want someone to do for you, do for them. This is the law and the prophets. It all hinges on this. Um, and we started to think, well, what does that translate to in the world today? And the two key components we felt were kindness in every interaction. Uh, and that is, that is easier said than done. But as you work together, we kind of made it a thing. And any time he and uh, Daniel and I work together on anything, kindness is imperative with each other, with a client, and uh, like I said, it's, it's easier said than done, but I think we owe that to the world and that being the, the highest calling of the law, loving someone else as much as you love yourself. But that followed up with candor and basically, but you can't lie to people and it's easy to lie to people and be nice to them, but how do you be kind and candid at all times? Uh, these two guide rules have transformed how he and I interact and uh, with others. So 
so yeah, that's uh, that's kind of some of our ethos. But Daniel, let's talk through some of the the journey that we take people on. Yeah, no, and I think I think just just when that that ethos is it really is a kind of guide guardrails and um, biblically based, and it allows us to really um, interact with each other in new novel ways, and also interact with um, customers and clients in ways that uh, they probably haven't interacted before with any entity. Remember, we're, not, we're, a design, um, we're an experienced design consultancy, so um, we are in the process of building experiences based on human behavior. So in, in that respect, we, we actually built a story. We actually, actually augmented and, and built a bespoke, a brand new kind of like, well, not brand new, but a customized design thinking process where we actually go through various islands. And these islands are actually stories of themselves. So when a client goes through a design thinking process where it is all about ideation, it's about iteration, it's about testing before you get your product out, it's about problem solving in the day. They actually don't just do it in a vacuum of these are the steps you do. They do it in the context of a story. So I don't know if you're adding to that, Jared. Yeah, let me share on that. So I think it's really key in our organizations, and I'm going to speak very pointedly into our Adventist organizations. Oftentimes we're, we're working together to reach people out there. That means we can treat each other like garbage. That means uh, we don't respect each other. Um, this issue is rampant. And it is probably the greatest cancer in Adventism. We don't appreciate each other. We don't respect each other. Yet we work together somehow in some way. And uh, I would challenge anyone to prove me wrong. So I'm going to look forward to that. But I say all that to say this. Daniel and I wanted to create an experience so that we don't just sit down with someone and say, okay, how do we make a great experience for your customers out there? We're going to take you through the most boring process to do that. We thought, no, 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 no. It's got to start here. This client has to feel like this is the most amazing experience they've ever been on. Take them through these places that are full of imagination uh, and, and full of meaning so that at the end of it, it's, this was worth our time and it was fun. And I'm a big believer. Everybody's got to experience our organizations like that worth our time. And I enjoyed it. I'd want to do it again. So, so anyway, that's just a little note there, Daniel, if you go to the next slide, we, yeah, we yeah. also, yeah, yeah. you want to say something? No, yeah, just just quickly on that note, because I appreciate it, because that this process has is applied. You may be wondering what kind of experiences do we design? It's primarily digital experiences, right? And we build out technology, but it's saying it's also physical as well. And we apply this process to actually the process of filmmaking, as an example, right? We've applied this process to um, regular digital app development. We've this design thinking is a process that should be problem solving across all ages, but experience design and what we focus on. Is really um, this this model applies across all, all, all areas? But yeah, Jared, Jared, talk about this. This is this is I'm excited about this. Yeah, so we're both new dads, and yeah. we love to create this idea of experiences where everyone's enjoying the experience. So we we both new dads to so these little girls. So we wrote a book based on our bespoke uh, design thinking process as a story that uh, kids would love, but not just love, but they would actually learn how do you how do you do design thinking? How do yeah. you make this a part of you so that you can go through life and every single thing you touch can go through this process, this iterative process? And so this is a book uh, we're looking to release soon. We're finishing a few of the illustrations, but yeah, anyway, that's something exciting we're working on. Yeah. yeah, this is exciting. I'm excited about this personally. And because design thinking is all about problem solving, how do we teach kids about that problem solving aspect? So let's, let's go on. Let's get into the, the practical side of things. So Joe, I'll let you leave with this and then I'll, I'll jump in with some areas. Sure. So basically to figure out your story and how you set yourself apart so that if somebody hears, oh, that company makes this for these people and here's why they do it. You got to make it memorable. And so you see these four steps, your origin story may be, and I would even say should be your differentiating factor. Don't knock the idea of going back and thinking through, okay, what's really my story? And if I considered all the details here, is it authentic to who we are? Don't sugarcoat it. People like honesty. Admit when you've failed. Um, and then if you have all these things figured out and you could easily explain it to someone else, investors want to know your story. They want to know you uh, have more meaning than just you're able to put a document together and ask for money. 
yeah, and I think just just to add to this, this, this is a kind of a, these are kind of nice, we're going to go broad and go a little bit narrow. These are nice broad guidelines in places. And just on that number four, investors seek out your story. There's some amazing stories about how VCs, like there's one story of a VC in, of Anderson Horowitz, which is a West Coast and um, um, very well-known VC in the Silicon Valley. And they talk relevant, they talk about how the stories of those that come in and pitch is really that distinguishing component, that distinguishing that actually drives them to actually invest compared to make the product being good aside, the story actually drives them to actually invest in that product. And I think one of those reasons is you can have a great product. Nobody's really interested in a great product these days. They need to have a great system that makes great products. Yeah. So that you can turn them out over and over because building a company is such an endeavor. You don't want to have to do it for every novel idea. You want to have a, an Elon Musk around that's just originating ideas, plugging it into your system and your, your culture. All right, so here's how you do it. So basically think of it like this. What is it you do? Who is it you do it for? And what's the value you provide? So we, we, we describe it like this, the action, the target audience, the value. So you're creating this story. You're, you're trying to think about if people are to tell others what you do, who you do it for, and really why you do it, is it that clear and concise? Because if it is, people will know your brand and you won't have to spend so much on advertising because they're going to be able to translate it for you. Uh, yeah. Daniel, take the first one, action. Yeah, happy to do it. And that's, I think it's interesting. I, I like, you know, as you're saying there, this, this kind of components there, it's this idea here, what we're trying to build is that as you begin to put your story together, you come up with a vision statement, a story vision statement. And that vision statement should be one sentence and it should be broken down into these different components. So broken down into the action, broken down into target, broken down into value. So action is simply this, focus on the best action word that we put here describing what the brand is doing to serve consumers. Maybe it's empowering, maybe it's I don't know, teaching, maybe it's coaching, maybe it's providing, you know, get that action word in there, right? We, we talk about empowering companies to create remarkable, authentic experiences through the lens of behavior analytics. You know, that's, that's our vision statement in, to, to, to a degree in that respect. But then there's also the target audience. If you want to pick this one up, Jared, I can fill in as well. Yeah, it's not, it really doesn't matter what you say you are. It's what other people think of you. So it's, it's key that you know, who are you trying to influence? Who are you trying to target? This is probably uh, one of the soapboxes that I get on a lot. Daniel, you can probably attest. Who are we talking to? And unfortunately, many times people say, well, everyone, I want everyone to be our customer. There's a saying, the niches are in the riches. And I would like to say they're not other places. Know who you're trying to reach. So if you are equipping who, target that group. And then what is the change you're gonna get when you actually target this group and they actually start to get what you're trying to do? And Daniel, you wanna add anything there? Yeah, and I think, I think it's interesting. There's a whole, there's a whole different you know, stream of work you could go down and talking about how to actually understand your target audience. But I think what Jared is saying is, 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 on, is actually on par here. This is what you're trying to do here is create your story. So you're trying to think about who that target audience is in the context of that story creation. And I think what's interesting with this as well is that even the way that you relate the story as you begin to relate it to partners, for example, how you relate your story to a media entity, for example, where they may want to know personally about you as the founders, may be different to the way you actually relate to a corporate entity and who a business entity who, uh, who actually is looking to invest and wanting to understand not just the founders, but also the actual structure of how your business is going to operate in its story context. So um, even audience within that capacity is important to know. And so that leads us to value, Jared. And if you want to mention anything about value, and I, I've got a couple of ideas here, but it's yeah, actually a value it. component. Sorry, Jared, if you had a thought on that. No, no, go for it. Like it, this idea here is that it's, it's kind of this transformation that has been created for the target audience. You know, what is the true value? In other words, I am giving and that we're providing that the company is giving and, and, and value should not be kind of put away. It's easy if you go through, okay, I figured out, if you go through the steps, right, I got the action word, I've got my target audience. But sometimes we, we fall at the value police and the value place is actually one of the most important pieces to actually get right. So I remember Daniel, somebody talking about Harley Davidson a few years ago. Oh, and yeah. if you took them through this process we just did, you know, they would describe it. We're equipping and then the who, who, who are they equipping? And then what are they doing to equip and change? And this person says, you know, so you're selling Harley Davidson motorcycles too. And they said, no, 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 no. 
We're not selling Harley, Harley Davidson motorcycles. We're selling to people whose lives are not really exciting, a way to live an exciting life and to feel alive. And typically that's people who are like accountants and they're not feeling like their life is alive, right? And, and he basically described as he told this, he said, the motorcycle is just the medium. That's just the product we happen to be selling you, but we're selling you. And then they obviously roll one of their fancy commercials, freedom, expression. You know, I thought it was awesome. All right, so here, I'm gonna give an example of what we just took everybody through with this slide of somebody making dough. All right, so what's, what's the value you're giving? Who are you giving it to? And what's the change that's gonna come from it? So I think a good way to do this would be, think of a, a food company that sells raw ingredients. We're gonna call this food company Scratch because they make ingredients from scratch. All right, so here's, here's the way I describe it. We're equipping young parents. I should probably read the slide. I'll, I'll butcher it first. But equipping young parents with all these great healthy ingredients so that they can have more family time together, eating together. And so this, obviously the slide says it a lot better. Basically, get back to that united family meal in the evening that is all but died in the world. And think of a company. We are selling, we're giving you the ingredients, young families that is, so that you can have these special moments together and therefore have a happier life. It just so happens we're selling you the raw ingredients, but our real intention is we're trying to get families back around the table. So anyway, that to me gets, gets me excited because you can take an idea and you can actually put meaning behind it and it can have meaning and change people's lives. Yeah, and what's powerful with this, and we wrote draft here specifically because Jared, Jared actually walked work, out exactly what that draft means, right? It's still working the idea out in, in our minds. Like, okay, this is what it could be. This is, this, is, this is just an example for you guys, right? So use, but look at, look at the three components. Where's the action, action component? Equip, there's our, there's our word there. Equip is an action. Who are the target audience? Well, it's young parents at this point. And Jared and I identify very clear with that being brand new dads, right? And then what's the value? The value here is yes, make healthy family meals, but it's more than that. It's the value is actually in actually coming, bringing everything back to this point in time where people actually get around the table and eat again, which we know in society, especially in Western society, has been eroding for many years. So here's just an example, but it's a draft, right? This is the idea of you put something down. It doesn't take long. This didn't take Jared and I long to put this down. This is an example but then it's gonna take a while to refine it and make it, and make it your own, so. And, and it's really important if you go to the next slide, Daniel, it's super important that people within your company are crystal clear on why you do what you do and how you do it. Otherwise, you're gonna have people come to work um, stressed out. They didn't have time to eat with their family last night because they were running reports for your company and they don't really like being here and they can't wait till the weekend so they can escape this drudgery. I think that's a key reason why people have to know inside your company, just as much as people outside, why is it we do what we do? And to remind everyone and to hopefully help everyone experience that same brand promise, brand story that you're wanting people out there. If you've got young parents within your company, they're experiencing it too. Uh, that's good. And, and, and I, Jared mentioned some key words that I'd, I'd love for us to keep in our mind as we go to the next section. We, I, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to try and zoom through the even more practical steps next. But those key words there are brand, right? We begin to think of the company, not as a company, but as a brand. And all, this, all the things that come with a brand really are its story. And the more pervasive something is, the more, the more something actually permeates every component of your startup, of your company, of the, of the brand then everyone understands, everyone relates, everyone, whether they're in work or not in work, actually relates that story and actually works and lives out that story for better use of a word or phrase in their everyday life. And when that happens, right, and for example, here's a good example. When I was at Yahoo many days, when Yahoo still exists, but uh, many years ago I was at Yahoo and uh, they would, I would have, there were some people there who were very much brand ambassadors, not because they were called that, they actually loved everything Yahoo. They were just so enamored with the brand. They'd have the cue and they'd even have the, the sound on their phone. Um, I believe there was this very specific sound on Yahoo, Yahoo is using in, in the US compared to the rest of the world. But it, it's, it's really neat how that 
how that permeates it, but it's, there you go, there's a brand there that, and a story that permeated that as well. So that's key. So on that note, um, I want to zip through this in five minutes if I can. So Jao, keep me honest in there. You're going to jump in with All me right. as well. So we've got a little bit broad and nice and kind of, kind of giving you some guiding principles of what are the things to look out for in the story? Then how do you begin creating that kind of first vision statement that helps you to actually ignite what your story is? No matter, even if you have a story, remember we can retrospectively, you can go back and tweak it using these principles. But I want to talk about is talk to you about something called uh, this this idea called storyscaping, and it's a it's a hugely valuable idea. We won't have time to go through all the detail, but I think what's really what's really powerful about this, I think the way we can show what this storyscaping definition means is if I show you an actual example of it in, in practice and play. So let's just take this very quickly. So let's you you have a product. Let's assume we're going to have someone called Jane. This is an example. Um, Jane owns a vegan pizza delivery company. Uh, there are two similar pizza joints in her town. So this is a town which obviously likes vegan pizza, which is awesome. And in order to grow her business, um, she chooses to advertise um, with a buy one, get one free, right? All of us see this. This is nothing different. This is a way that if you have a product, you are beginning to differentiate yourself based on price. And this makes sense. Makes sense to absolutely everyone. But just differentiating yourself purely in price alone is not going to grow your business. It's not going to grow your brand. It's not going to grow your audience. It's not going to allow you to actually tap all the different resources of what's happening. So Jane needs to do something else. So what does Jane do in addition to that? She does everything in the price-based differentiation model, but she does this. She also includes a story approach to what she's doing. So now what she does, Jane shares her story about where she learned to make a secret sauce and, you know, that's a hundred year old recipe from Italy, whatever it may be, there's these things. So it begins to personalize, humanize what her pizza her brand is all about and why she's passionate about it. But it's, it's a story that's also personal to her as the founder. So all of a sudden now you have this price differentiation and then you have this story-based differentiation. So now you can see you're getting a leg, leg in the market now. You're, you're making some progress. But it shouldn't stop there, right? The next thing that needs to do, Jane needs to actually do something based on experience, right? So she's got the price down. She's got the story-based definition differentiation down. Now she needs to do something to actually enhance the experience of people interacting with her business. So what she does, she chooses to offer um, guaranteed delivery in 30 minutes or less in the area she lives in. And she also spends a bit of money investing in a mobile app. And in that mobile app, it allows people to order seamlessly and um, wherever they may be. And by the time they get home, the pizza's also arrived on the doorstep at the time they get home. So there is this, there's this approach here where she's beginning now to build that experience. So price differentiation, she builds on that story-based, experience-based, and now it's story-scape differentiation. So what is, what is the kind of the story-scape differentiation be? So this is all the previous steps. But here's the key, it's, the, it's balancing the elements of value of story and experience. And it's, a, it's basically this laser focus on becoming part of the customer world of creating an immersive world. So basically what she begins to do in this arena, she reimagines her whole business. She has a story that authentically connects with people. She's creating an experience that delivers a product, but now she's gonna create an immersive world of connection. There's the key word I want us to remember, of connection that's actually gonna help her to drive through that story. And really, so, you know, and that's kind of what I want to get to in the next slide very, very quickly here. You see the connection aspect here, this storyscaping, it's all about connection and, and connecting with your brand or connecting your brand with the audience. And it doesn't occur in a vacuum. Right? It doesn't just simply occur at some point in time. You know, and you've got to look at the, the experience space and the experience space, the way we understand that essentially is the context. So I'm trying to think of a better phrase, but the context keyword context of, in which the brand can better understand and they can service the customer needs. And in that way, you're actually creating a useful and purposeful role for your brand in people's lives. That's where you begin to connect. And if you do that, you're going to doing that, you're actually going to provide emotional value. You're actually going to experience value and it's going to be both valuable for an emotional and actually inspires behavior to change. So the connection points, the experience space in which you can connect are huge. Think of the way that technology is doing it. Think of the way that you can connect, yes, through social media and those aspects, but the different ways in which technology, as an example, can impact the way you do business. Think of the Internet of Things. So this connection, this experience space in which your brand lives in is vitally important if you want to grow and build your brand to simply just one that differentiates against something else. That's right. And any, any thoughts on that, Joe, before I jump into the next no. one? Keep so going, I yeah, I'm on a roll and I know time is short. I want to get you guys to have some questions. So I want to get this. So just thinking about this very quickly and um, think about it in this way, right? And 
and this this describes storyscaping in in the in the context of a, of experience and of kind of an experience space. You have your brand strategy, and your brand strategy and is one where you begin to call your company not by company, and it's like I, I own this company. You actually refer to your company more as a brand. You begin to personify that brand. You begin to give it humanized characteristics, personality characteristics, and that's what Nike does. That's what Jad mentioned. The Harley Davidson does, right? Your brand isn't just a company it now becomes something with a little bit of a story behind it in the same way you position your product these are marketing 101 techniques right you position your product in a good place so that you can actually have an, an opportunity for that product to actually sell whatever it may be in the marketplace or whatever engagement you're designing from that and then on the other side you have the consumer insights components you are you're trying to understand the behavior of the user they their, their, their desires, their, their emotional values, what, what really drives them. And then you're also looking at their, their consumer journey. So if you look at the top parts and the bottom parts, and the very bottom parts, two and four, this is a very utilitarian approach, right? So your product's position in the market, there's a journey in which people need a certain product, whether they need to buy new clothes or something, and there's a shared experience, whether they buy it through an app or something, which they all undertake, right? And that's we all understand that. That just happens. That's how we buy, sell, consumerism as an example right and this can be for services as well as products it doesn't have to be just for products but then the top part is really the important part here because really your brand strategy and your consumer insights here's where you begin to connect people through shared values and these shared values are not simply just saying my company believes in this these are our values this is where the actual consumer actually buys into understands feels part of the values that you have and hopefully those values are good values right you think of Tom's shoes. Tom's um, is a great example, and I know there's there's you know there's sometimes there's controversy about how they operate, but their basic premise is this: they started as a company that for every pair of shoes they sold, they would give a pair of shoes to a disadvantaged child and um, who needs one, wherever they may be globally, and that business has grown into different things. And so the consumer insights, their emotions, their desires, that actually ties in nicely with the brand strategy and purpose. And so the connection is through shared values, not through this is my value as a company. Will you accept it or not? It's actually a shared value that both the consumer and the brand have, right? Your company has. And if you tie all these together, all of a sudden now you have this wonderfully strong ecosystem that helps you do this. And this is what I want to get to quickly. Um, and I want to be cognizant of the time. This is our last second to last slide here. What it helps you do is get to this. It helps you get to an, an idea which is called the organizing idea. And what's the organizing idea? It's, it's, it's not that difficult to understand it. You may say, well, is it just another big idea? Actually, the organizing idea is much more than that. It's a method, it's an approach to actually helping you shape the core aspects of what your story actually does. For example, in, in the brand of Red Bull, their organizing idea is around this idea of um, taking flight. So I think it's, uh, um, it gives you wings, right? This is their idea. This is their organizing idea, which is their brand. But that organizing idea of taking flight or Red Bull gives you wings, you know what it allows them to do? It allows them to then do all the things that they do, right? There's adventure sports. There's people jumping off hot air balloons and, and from outer space. There's people um, doing these, um, you know, daredevil tactics, right? Things that go beyond, but all of the things that they sponsor and they're involved in, all of those actually talk into their brand organizing idea, which is, which is born out of their actual story that they built as a company. And so... Think about that logically. And this is just an idea that, you know, there isn't a exact science to this, but there are many inputs that come into play. And there's a great book called Storyscaping that kind of helps explain these inputs. But here are just a few of those inputs that come into play. But it really helps you to begin to hone down your story and get your story right. And so, and the reason we want to kind of bring you here is basically this. As we are developing a story, right, there are, you know, rather than just sitting down, what is my company story? What should I tell people about? Placing an emphasis is actually core to your brand. And the story itself is so important. It's so important. And here's a great quote that I think sums up everything we've been talking about today, right? It says this, basically, quickly, this is here. A story can go where quantitative analysis is denied admission, our hearts. And we know that, right, from, from, from the Bible. Data can persuade people, but it doesn't inspire them to act. To do that, you need to wrap your vision in a story that fires the imagination and stirs the soul. Mm -hmm. And with that, Jared, I'll leave you with any like, final thoughts that you may have. I just try to zoom through that. Yeah, we, we'd love to hear from some people if there are uh, if there's some stories and questions and things you've got. So we'd love to just open it up. Christina, if there's any questions that you've gotten in. 
Yes. Well, thank you, Daniel and Jared, for such a powerful and packed presentation. So yes, we have quite a few comments that have come in. So let me just kind of share it with you because I know it's in a different platform. So let me just go Daniel in. Daniel will be happy to answer those. <laughs> so people, yeah. So people want to really know where they can, um, if they can have access to the presentation that you guys have shared, really packed with knowledge and some resources. Absolutely, not a problem. And um, we can perfect send. I don't know. There's a method you may have, Christina, or we can yeah, whatever you, methods. Perfect. And I can, and I can share the um, my email address. So if you want access to the presentation, just feel free to email it to me, and I'll be happy to forward it to you guys. Um, some people here are joining and sharing kind of some of their stories. There is Roque Rojas. Um, he talks about. He says, "My story is that I'm recovering gaming addict and experiencing." Mm -hmm her that have that has experienced heard in the church but found god or he found me and now i want to reach out other gamers for the gospel there is another story that has come in um and it says my story oh people keep typing so Okay, my story is that I'm called to be a full-time or short-term medical missionary. Um, she goes on trip. This is Nardia, um, wherever God leads her. She has started this new small business. It's called Herbal Tea. It's about Herbal Tea Blends supplement line, and it's called Created Power for You. So those are some of the comments that have come in. Um, are there any other questions, any thoughts that you guys have for Jared and Daniel um, as we're closing in the next few minutes here that you would like them to, to have answers for? You know, I just really thought it was, as we have questions coming in here, you know, I just really thought it was interesting, you know, how making sure that whenever we're starting something new, you know, knowing really what you do who you do it for and why you do it. What's your story? You know, I think all of us have something unique to bring to the world. Um, and how do we pack that and how we um, tell that for the world to see? Yeah, and I think I mean, one comment we can make on that, I think, it, thanks for putting that. And for everyone who's listening, you know, one thing that is important is that the story that you tell, and um, as you begin to tell it, and some of those are, we've seen our personal experiences, which actually, build into the brand but you know the story ultimately is is not bigger than you you know there's a, a good example of ben and jerry's as, a, as an example as a fun example though they, who make that ice cream but who said at some point the stories are not, never not about the founders anymore they're actually it's actually about what we've created in, in that aspect and i think ultimately that's all the when we think about giving the glory back to god and the story that we create where is the worth of your story ultimately assigned to is that worth assigned to to god or is it a sign to I'm getting in, I'm enjoying this, I'm being successful, this is my story, or you know, and I think I think that's there's, there's some there's something important now that Jared and I always try and keep to mind when we when we talk about this. Yeah, very true. There is another story that came just now. It's from Ashley Blake, and she says, My story is to serve a community of Christ centered services. Yeah, and, this, and as you go through that. So yeah. she's asking on any, so she, sorry, my internet is not the best. I think I caught you off, Daniel. I got a question that just came in. Yeah. It says, any tips from Ashley again, any tips on how to tell the story over organization to the peers so that they do not only want to join for personal gain, um, but actually are empowered to serve? Really good question. I'm going to put it on the chat for you. Yeah. Joe, you want to take a crack? Yeah, I can take a crack. Any tips on how to tell the story of our organization? Um, is that just saying her, her organization? I don't know much about the organization. Or are we talking like the Adventist church? So it's here. I'm sending it to you. So she is the, um, the, She's a story that she's running a college student-led organization on the campus that serves and hopes to serve the community with a Christ Center service. Mm -hmm. So I'm sending it here. Yeah. There we go. I have some thoughts, Jay, if you have any thoughts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my two cents would be don't assume in the world today people understand 
what you're saying is what they believe you're saying. So in other words, if I go out to all of my peers and I said, I'm a Christian, most of them would say, okay, then you are the enemy. You are the problem with America. So don't assume that you saying, well, wait, 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 wait. I said, I'm a Christian that people have a good idea of that. So in other words, I'm, I'm picking on uh, a ministry student led serve our community with Christ centered service. People may think that's just race racism. I mean, we live in such a crazy world that you have to literally, and I'm a big fan right now, change the vocabulary, use entirely different words to tell people what you believe, what you think, because if you use words that they think they know what you mean, you're already losing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, like, thanks. Good point, Jared. And I think, I think, and I think you mentioned, and I saw the early comment there as well. It's about telling the story to your peers as well, whether those peers are and those within an organization or partner in an organization, as well as those who, who don't know. And I think, I think it comes down to this, and we, we spoke about this earlier. Um, you know, like you wrote here that your story is running a college student-led organization on campus that aims to serve community with Christ and to service. That's great as a beginning kind of thought process. Um, but if you spend a little bit of time building that out, building out the personal relevancies, the personal testimony components within that, all of a sudden now, now that becomes a shared value concept. This becomes a shared experience concept that someone else can actually find relevant in their lives. And so it's it's almost like take what you have here, which is brilliant, and now build out the story as kind of the ways ways of showing you to build it out. And if you build it out into this this comprehensive approach, there's going to be an element there that people are going to be attracted to, right? There's and and the personal doesn't always have to be like I went through this in personal, but it could be an example of how people have been affected by this or the impact that's being made. And I think you can begin to shape those into a coherent structure. But the key is a coherent structure and getting those components together. And that's kind of why we try to put some things here together for that. So it's, it's building it out more. I, I like where you're going with that. It's, it's wonderful, but it's building it out more that's going to have relevancy as, as you know, the, the truths that under the facts, the truths that underlie the accuracy of the stories we were learning earlier. So. Perfect. So yeah, people are saying that's a really valid point. Um, they agree with the fact of having those stories to really tell who we are and how we can impact others. Oh, sorry. I think we are. Thank you, Christina, for the opportunity. Yeah. We will share our details with Christina as well. Can you hear oh. me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? I can't hear. Okay, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, we're having connectivity issues today, but everything is um, getting fixed. So people are saying thank you so much for the valuable advice. Um, they do appreciate both of you coming in today and taking the time. Thank you so much, Daniel and Jared. Um, we appreciate you both. Um, and yeah, so right now for everyone who's joined this seminar, we're going to go back to the live, to the live main event. So just click right in about a minute from now, we're going to go back and join there. So we'll hope to see you there. Thank you so much, Jared and Daniel again. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.